Hello and welcome back to the Masonic Roundtable, a weekly program where Masons from around the world get together to talk about Masonic news and opinions in a friendly and social manner. As a reminder, the thoughts and opinions expressed here are solely the opinions of the participants and do not represent any Grand Lodge statements or positions. Make sure you keep your conversations open for the public and on the level. To interact with us, send questions and comments to our Twitter page at Mason Roundtable on the Facebook event page for episode 224, The History of the Grand Lodge of Florida, or in the YouTube chat running alongside this video. As for introductions, my name is John Ruark. I'm a past master of the Patriot Lodge number 1957 and uh, yeah, in the Grand Lodge of Virginia. Next up, we have Robert Johnson. Introduce yourself, please. Robert Johnson, uh, past master, Walking and Lodge number 78, current sitting secretary in a past DDGM. So there, how about that? All righty, R-dubs. Mike the Intern, welcome, welcome. Hey, it's Mike the Intern from Village Lodge number 274 and Triandria Lodge 780, where I am the junior steward and lodge education officer. Good evening. Good evening, good evening. All right. Man of the hour, Juan Sepulveda. How are you tonight? Buenas noches. Very good over here. Juan Sepulveda from Orange Blossom Lodge number 80 in sunny Kissimmee, Florida. Rainy Kissimmee, Florida. And the host of the Winding Stairs Freemasonry podcast. I'll take a, a rainy day in Florida any day. Uh, next up, last but not least, V, Jason Richards. Hey, good evening, everybody. Jason Richards here, past master of Acacia Lodge number 16 in Clifton, Virginia, member of Colonial Lodge number 1821 in Washington, D.C. Excellent, excellent. Good. Full house tonight. Uh, for Masonic News, we have straight out of Reddit as well as uh, just late breaking off of this Hodap's blog, we have, as Chris calls it, NS over Amity. Uh, I don't know if we mentioned it on this show, <clears throat> but I know we've had the publishers of this app called Amity, where a traveling brother can go whip out his iPhone or Android and see lodges that are recognized, <clears throat> according to his jurisdiction, right from the palm of his hand and it uh it has come back into the news as of late only because juan's looking his lodge up right now yep you're you're not clandestine good for you juan uh, it came up uh, recently because there was a northeast conference of grand masters where most worshipful car b willie the grand secretary of rhode island uh, made a statement, which you can see here, <clears throat> which says that the Grand Lodge of Rhode Island will no longer support or approve anything to do with the application called Amity. Your personal data is at risk, as he, the owner, will not explain, that's how it's written, how he is generating his income or what he is doing with our data. He has already approached the owner of Grand View, our database program, and asked to buy our membership data which Jeff admittedly refused to do so at the Northeast Conference of Grand Masters and Grand Secretaries, which was held this weekend here in R Rhode Island. All 13 states in attendance unanimously agreed to reject any approach or support to Amity. That being the case, of the 23 individuals who signed up in Rhode Island, I have unverified each of you, including myself, and we will no longer provide any input to Amity from this point forward signed the Grand Secretary of the Grand Lodge of Rhode Island. Uh, Robert, you had these developers on your show recently, haven't you? Yeah, I sure did. And um, I woke up this morning, I saw this linked, and I was like, what in the hell, right? Like, because number one, I care about Freemasonry. Number two, um, I openly uh, supported them and so have many other folks. Uh, it wasn't until I read the accusation when I realized like, um, it was just really um, disconcerting, I should say, because the general idea of what's being proposed in this statement by the, the Grand Secretary, those are uh, patently false. Um, the, the thing is, is that 
time and time again uh, for on Ex Oriente, um, <clears throat> excuse me, on my own podcast. And um, uh, brothers, you'll forgive me, uh, Fort Worth Lodge, number 148, uh, had a podcast. And they've been on all of those where they have explained where they get their funding from. Uh, they've explained that they all have full-time jobs and, and all of this. And the fact that uh, <clears throat> I razzed them about uh, potentially influencing Masonic elections with the uh, privacy of their data being broken, you know, like some kind of Russia thing. Um, and we we talked about how safe the, the data is and how unwilling they are to sell data or try to gather it in some sort of nefarious way. Um, and Chris Hodap really did a great write-up on this. Really, Chris does a, a wonderful job of, of writing up these articles where he takes a, a pretty neutral position, but also will point out some things that, uh, that, that are really eye-opening. And I think in this particular article, he did a great job. Uh, he ends it by saying he, he, he thinks Amity is a, is a wonderful service, and I can't agree more. I mean, I, as somebody who literally went to every Grand Lodge website and stripped off every single lodge and tried to put it into an Excel database. Um, I know firsthand how ridiculous that sounds and how, I mean, it is grueling and awful. You know, when you turn on a cool game and there's like side quests and you're only going to get the cool thing. If you beat all the side quests and you just got to grind, that's what it is. <laughs> and uh, it was such a grind to do that. And I don't envy the guys at Amity at all. Well, I mean, uh, yeah, if, you, if you even consider what there's pentagram, Oops, sorry, Pentagraph Publishing, which does <clears throat> the list of lodges Masonic, right? But why do they get a pass, right? Because they do a lot of work in doing the exact same thing, but in an antiquated paperback offline form. Um, so just, just comparing apples to apples, it, it's, you know, it, it, it seems kind of, kind of at least one-sided for the same kind of data. Um, but yeah, I mean, you, you bring up a good point that, uh, these guys are trying to do it on the up and up, right? Um, and it was a valuable service. And basically all the accusations were completely false. And, and so it's, it's really frustrating. Again, it's, I'm not speaking on behalf of my Grand Lodge, but and it's not my Grand Lodge that made any of these uh, uh, you know, uh, mandates. But it's really frustrating that um, so, something can happen so swiftly through without any sort of um, you know, conversation about are these things actually factual that we're making decisions on uh, and and how that that decision making happens at such a centralized top um, yeah. it was perfect too I, I was actually talking to a brother this morning brother you're watching the show right now I already know um, but uh, what this brother was particularly upset about was the fact that there was no real due inquiry into this other than like a man, you know, a man is supposed to be as good as his word. And so among Masons, if I say something to John about some brother, John can take that to the bank. Uh, but in this case, I have no doubt that this brother the grand secretary felt this was true. You know, I, I don't think any brother would lie about something, but he felt this was true and he said something about it. And, and now there's this whole thing. And that's just a bummer because the information is just not true. But uh, all we can do, I guess is, is, is in my case is support it. I know my grand lodge has been um, participating. Um, and uh, as you could hear in the Wentz Game You podcast in the episode they were on, you know, my grand secretary has been really uh, wonderful with the idea. So uh, I'm all about technology. We're all about technology. You're about technology, too, because you're watching a show about masonry on YouTube or you're listening to it in your ear, uh, you know, when it's when it goes out on the podcast. It's just the way of the future. And I don't know. It's it, you're we're transparent already, so I don't understand where the, right. miscon, the, the misconception comes from. And, and you know, the question I have, even for uh, the Grand Secretary of Rhode Island about this, um, has the Grand Lodge of Rhode Island published their privacy policy? Because I don't, I mean, I, 
don't get me wrong, but I don't think I've seen one for the Grand Lodge of Ohio. I'm not saying that they don't have one. I'm just saying that I don't think I've actually seen one. So, you know, um, what, you know, I mean, th this same argument applies, you know, um, you have, a you know, if you're going to say that you're not going to help support this other thing because you don't understand their privacy or the, you know, what they're doing to generate money, uh, I, I got the same questions, you know, uh, for that, for that Grand Lodge who is suspicious of a free and open, uh, app that the guys actually tell, I mean, it's right there. They do have a privacy policy on it. So there you go. Just two clicks would have found yeah. the privacy policy and all the details, which, um, you go hop on the Reddit, you'll see that the developer chimes in. And goes line by line and answers all of those acqu accusations very articulately says we've been open the whole time we've been on all these podcasts here's where we stand like there you go if someone had just reached out to me i could have said all that and yet here we are so hopefully that will get overturned in the near future and we will uh i'll be back using the app that we know and love to visit lodges that's all we're trying to do good stuff okay without further ado let's get over to V Juan Sepulveda for his history of the Grand Lodge of Florida. Juan, are you ready? Thank you, John. Uh, yes. I wanted to start by, by asking this rhetorical question. How many of you are interested in your ancestry or the genealogy of your family? And if you think about whenever you start getting interested, because not everyone is interested in that, but when you first get interested, and maybe you open up an account with uh, Ancestry.com or one of the other uh, competitors, you go bananas. You start searching. You spend day and night looking and trying to find out links to your family origins and all these things. Well, something similar is what I see here that happened with the Grand Lodge of Florida. And I want to start the uh, telling you about the Grand Lodge of Florida of, of something that happened in 1898. At first, it was very, very murky, hardly any information about what happened in the years prior uh, or in the, in the beginning years of Masonic activity in Florida. But then in 1898, something, something surfaced that uh, got the, the grandmaster at the time very excited about finding more details about the origin of uh, Freemasonry in in Florida, and it was the a gift given to to the Grand Lodge by Dr. F. F. Bond of Thorncliffe Bryhouse, England, and the gift was a copy of Preston's Masonic illustrations, and it was dedicated on the inside cover, and it said the following. The gift of James Mary to St. Andrew's Lodge, number one, West Florida, June 27, 1776. So here we're talking about, uh, what, 122 years later, we are, you know, this book comes, comes up and they start finding out more information because of this. So the Grand Master... Let me find his name here. Uh, Most Worshipful James Hillard, Grandmaster in 1898. He appointed Right Worshipful Silas Wright, Deputy Grandmaster, to search for any additional information and to compile a report and come back in, in you know, with his findings. So what he did is he actually reached out to different uh, Grand Lodges, mainly the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania. Now, you might ask, why the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania? Well, being one of the oldest uh, Grand Lodges in, in the States, it would have been the one to carry the burden of safeguarding documents and, and keeping records of, of things that happen in different uh, provinces. Fortunately, the Grand Lodge of Pennsylvania's secretary replied with with good news that they had documents and records in position that proved the existence of masonry in Florida during the early periods of the country. Now, as I looked around for, for more information, I, I was looking at different sources and trying to, and, and I couldn't get a very clear 
timeline of how everything uh, transpired. So I'm I'm doing my very best to to keep it all in in track here. But one of the the cool things that that we find is that among the documents that were found in Pennsylvania, which were compiled under uh, like a, a, a box labeled Old Masonic Lodges of Pennsylvania, Moderns and Ancients, 1730 to 1800s. So if no one had inquired about these documents, God knows how much longer it would have taken for them to come across these uh, origin documents of, of Florida masonry. So among the documents they had, let me see here. They had, is it a charter? Yeah, the charter for St. Andrew's Lodge Number 1 of West Florida, which was issued in May 3rd, 1771. Now, the cool thing is that this was, uh, it was endorsed or issued by the Provincial Grand Lodge of the Southern District of North America. And, and I'll put in, in perspective, what was happening in the country, we were, we're a British, uh, well, part of the, the of this area was was British. The the Florida was part of a uh, Spanish, you know, Spain's possession for the longest time. So, what happened is that we had a group of ten master masons who had petitioned a lodge to their, and they were all members of Lodge Number One Hundred Eight. Scotland. So the first lodge, the St. Andrew's Lodge, uh, number one, is is started by 10 Scottish Masons that were part of the 31st Regiment of Foot of the British Army. And they were stationed in Pensacola, which is western Florida. Uh, have, have any of you been to Tallahassee, Pensacola, like that northern Florida area? Well, Right now, if you were to think about, that is the closest you get to Georgia. So you'll see a couple of things transpire where some of the Masonic activity kind of fluctuates up and down that area. So you'll have uh, North Florida, South Georgia Masonic activity that's part of the Florida heritage. So these Master Masons received a charter signed by James Grand, Provincial Grand Master, of the Provincial Grand Lodge of the Southern District of North America. And another, other documents of the time were the minutes. Now, these proved to be very important because minutes matter. Hashtag minutes matter. I need a shirt. Hashtag minutes matter. Uh, <laughs> it, it documents the, the, the difficulties that this early lodge was having at the time. And there was animosity against Masonic uh, organizations from both the Spanish government and the, it's not Jesuits, what's the other? Dominican priest, priesthood. Hmm. So both of those powerhouses were against Masonic activity. And we'll see later on how they play a role in squashing anything Masonic that dared surface in the area. So as they continue to look for documents, they find under the date of March 17th, going chronologically on, on, on this history, 1769 is where there is a petition from James Grant Esquire, who was the governor of the province of, the province of East Florida. Um, and that was the petition to to have the basically to be provincial grandmasters of this uh, of the region. Um, the next thing that I thought was really cool is that in 1783 uh, we have Saint Augustine's uh, no Saint Andrew's Lodge still in, in place, and then in 1768. Um, let me see here. March 18th, March of Scotland. Okay, so there's another charter that dates 1768, and this is uh, Grand East Florida Lodge number 
143, and it's in St. Augustine, also a territory of Florida. So Honorable James Grant, Grant, James Grant, governor of the territory of Florida, he was named provincial grand master. So he is the one that actually was able to then sign from the territory. So you have I'm trying to straighten the, the order out. First, you have them petitioning to be a grand territory, but they aren't. So St. Andrews petitions directly, uh, basically to, to Scotland to, to get the charter. 1783, the Dominican priesthood and the Spanish government squashed St. Andrews. So they have to go into hiding. Also, the, so this happened in 17, pardon my chicken scratch here, 1768, there's the charter for the territory. 1783, they're suppressed. So they pretty much have to go into hiding, which is part of the reason why we have so very little documentation of what of what happened. Because in, in 1780, in eight, 1781, that whole period, Spanish were, um, let me see here. The territory of West Florida says was captured by Spanish in 1781 that that's a little bit confusing to me um because this whole peninsula was was spanish i just don't know how far up they would have considered it to be the territory of florida so what they ended up doing is taking whatever they could take and going up north and they went up north all the way to south carolina and south carolina had lodges uh over there but they were under the provincial grand lodge of no they were under the grand lodge of pennsylvania so that clarifies why we find documents of, of florida up there in, in pennsylvania so what they in their attempt to you know go to a excuse me a, a safer place now to put in uh, part of the as uh, part of the timeline 1776, we have the um, independence of, uh, of of America, North America. So here we are, what, from 76, uh, 20, no, 10, less than 10 years. What, 76? What do I say? Six years later. We have them now fleeing all the way up to South Carolina. And... They receive permission, authorization, and, and the authorization that they receive uh, from the Grand Master, Provincial Grand Master of St. Augustine says the following, under your charter, you can work until it shall please God to restore you to the ancient seat of your lodge in West Florida. So there still was some sort of a presence here in Florida and allows them to go and work in in what you call it, uh, South Carolina. That didn't last very long because in compliance with the dispensation and to uh, assure adequate and proper Masonic protection, they called a meeting of ancient lodges of free and accepted Masons in Charlestown, Charlestown, but it's Charleston, South Carolina, for them to, to be examined by South Carolina. So they are examined, deemed regular, and they're accepted to work from their arrival in 82 until July of 83. So less than a year of, you imagine like you had to take everything and run and try to practice, you know, you know masonry up in a different uh, territory. And in less than a year, now you no longer have a, uh, a charter. Because they in in Florida, masonry was uh, squashed again by the government and the Dominicans. Can I say Dominicans? Dominican priesthoods. I just don't want my brothers from the Republic to think and talk about them. Uh, <laughs> so, in eighty three, they lose their their charter. So, the lodge that is then now chartered on as Lodge Number Forty in Charleston, South Carolina. So this comes now from 
uh, Pennsylvania. So they are now a Pennsylvania lodge. This happens for, you know, they stay with that charter until 1787 when they surrender their charter and join four other lodges to form the Grand Lodge of South Carolina. So these enterprising brothers now, they, they you know, return their charter and now they establish the Grand Lodge of South Carolina. The next step, do you have any questions well, before I, I proceed? No, just one observation though, it's interesting. One, the, the Scottish influence down in, in Florida as well, based off of uh, you know, what we learned about Virginia last, last week. Um, and then trying to track the timelines too of what's going on post uh, revolution, uh, as well as the other grand lodges that are forming around this time frame. So, so we're kind of up to uh, 1788 at, at the formation of the Grand Lodge of South Carolina, where at that time there was uh, already existing the Grand Lodge of Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, Georgia, New Jersey, Maryland, and then North and South Carolina. Now, I'd wonder, though, why, if Georgia was at that time established, well, they had they had fleed north to South Carolina before, I would imagine, before Georgia was established. We'll have to look into that. Yep. It's, it's interesting, though. Mm -hmm. And the next thing, they had that, that charter, St. Andrews. Well, for some reason, it says that they didn't have the name of St. Andrews at that point. So it was just Lodge Number 40. But other documents that I've seen refer to it as St. Andrews anyway, uh, even though the number for the lodge changed. So there's some discrepancy there that I, I couldn't find um, a solution for. Or, But then they, they remained under the pretty much the Grand Lodge of South Carolina and continued to work until 1881 when its charter was surrendered and stricken from the rolls. So here something happened because now a lot of stuff begins to happen in, in, in rapid succession. And it seems like there is an attempt to reconstitute the lodge, but I'll, I'll tell you right now. 17... Yeah, 1881. Okay. What happened after the South Carolina, which was, what did I tell you? South Carolina, 1787. So they were, South Carolina was comprised of those four lodges and they, of course, continued to, to grow. But here's something that happened in Florida almost to regain activity back in, in Florida. In 1806, San Fernando Lodge in St. Augustine was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Georgia. And it was subsequently suppressed by a mandate of the Spanish government. In 1820, the Grand Lodge of South Carolina granted a charter to Floridian Virtue Lodge number 28, but it couldn't survive the political and religious uh, uh, basically the, the, the resistance that they found uh, over there. Then again in 1824, the Grand Lodge of South Carolina granted another charter called to Esperanza Lodge of St. Augustine. And it said that the majority of these members, for whatever reason, moved to Havana, Cuba. And so this, this lodge also dissipated. I couldn't find any details of the reasons they moved to to Havana. Probably the mosquitoes I would have moved to. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the next meaningful move of uh, Florida masonry happens in 1825. December of 1825, the Grand Lodge of Alabama issues a warrant to Jackson Lodge number 23 in Tallahassee, which at the time was now considered the territory of Florida. And it's an American, um, it's a, it, it's part of the US territory. And just to give you a, a little bit of context, it is considered the territory of Florida between 1819, 
they're about to 1845. Let me see, 1819. Because the Florida Purchase is 1819. So that's the Florida Purchase. But it's considered territory of Florida from the 22 to 45. And then on March 3rd of, the, of uh, 1845 is considered the state of Florida. So it's incorporated into the state of Florida. Next up, because this lodge is chartered by, I mean, it's warranted by the Grand Lodge of Alabama. It's still not necessarily, it's not yet the Grand Lodge of Florida. Another warrant was issued on December 2nd, 1826 to Washington Lodge Number 1. This is by the uh, Grand Lodge of Georgia. This one sticks. This was in Quincy, Florida. Then on December 8, 1829, almost exactly three years later, the Grand Lodge of Georgia warranted Harmony Lodge Number 2 in Mariana, Florida. And... The three lodges come together, and this is what you would consider the birth of the Grand Lodge of Florida. And at a regular meeting in May of 1830, Jackson Lodge Number 23, which was that original uh, warranted uh, lodge from the Grand Lodge of Alabama, they adopt a resolution to invite Washington Lodge Number 1 and Harmony Lodge Number 2 to join together in the organization of the Grand Lodge of the Territory of Florida. So over the past, you know, over the next um few months they they get together to try to decide what to do so i have here that on monday july 5th nine, uh, 1830 the delegates of three lodge met together in the masonic temple at jackson lodge in tallahassee and presiding over the meeting was brother john duval of jackson lodge and they pretty, the first order of business was to organize the adoption of the resolution stating the, the right for the body to incorporate into the Grand Lodge of Florida. So that is the birth of the Grand Lodge of Florida. Now, there's one um, one thing that happens at, at, upon the, basically, I don't know what to call it, the incorporation of the Grand Lodge of, of Florida they then decide to adopt the the rules and bylaws of the Grand Lodge of Alabama. That was the, the warranting Grand Lodge of Jackson Lodge. But in immediately put together a committee to start looking at how they can make it more, you know, pretty much adjusted so that it can become Florida's bylaws and Florida's rules. And remember, I told you that those territories being so close together, there's this meddling together. You have Alabama, you have South Carolina, Pennsylvania. All these Grand Lodges are like doing business around the same um, area. Something happened in 1839 where Orion Lodge number eight, that was chartered by Grand Lodge of Florida. This is at Pleasant Grove, Georgia. Uh, wait, Orion Lodge number eight. Yeah, Pleasant Grove at Pleasant Grove, Georgia, near the Florida line in 1839. Two years later, the the grand body, uh, the, the the Grand Lodge of Georgia, kind of like catches, you know, notice of of this. Is like, okay, how come we have a Florida lodge in our territory? So they immediately decide to to call it a Orion Lodge. It says here, a resolution was adopted officially declaring Orion Lodge to be a lodge of clandestine clandestine masons. Wow. Yeah. And explanations started happening. So they start now communicating like, whoa, wait, let, let's let's talk about this. And there was official communication between the Grand Lodge of Florida and the Grand Lodge of, of Georgia. And because there was no ill intent, they, they, the Grand Lodge of Florida uh, said, you know, we apologize for this, you know, for this oversight. And if, if you will examine them and, 
accept them into your lodge, like into your grand lodge, you can you can have them. So basically, they decided to. It says Florida released claim on Orion Lodge, and Georgia received it in full fellowship. And to cement the bond of goodwill and fellowship, Florida resolved that no other Florida lodge should ever bear the number eight as its uh, lodge number. So we don't have a Florida lodge number eight. And there's another thing that happened in that thing, but I'll report later about it, where it was decided that the Florida lodges would also not have, would not bear the name of a living person. Um, so you won't, you won't find any, uh, any lodges in Florida that have pretty much a, a person's name in it. So if you're looking to est establish the Juan Sepulveda Lodge, I'll have to go clandestine. You got, you got to wait <laughs> or, or just knock off one. Yeah. Yeah, so that's that's what I have about the Grand Lodge of Florida. I thought it was fascinating to to recognize like the difficulties. And I know a few years ago I I started trying to find information about the earliest lodges in Florida and how some of them seemed to have disappeared. Um and like why, like what caused it. And to come back now and do a little bit more research and, and find some answers to those questions I had you know, some time ago, it, it's been very rewarding. So it was fun. That's great. Um, not many questions on the uh, YouTube chat um, or, or the Facebook group, but I at least wanted to thank you, Juan, for the research you've done. I found it fascinating for a couple of reasons. One, the Scottish influence, um, again, that, that we talked about a little bit earlier, um, as well as the, the migratory pattern of uh, masonry as as far as it, it, col colonial masonry in America is just a fascinating subject to me because of how it was order out of chaos. Yes. <laughs> right? Exactly. Um, I, one of my like little fun projects to do one day, I'm going to do a lodge presentation and show geographically where all these lodges were and who they were chartered by and how they got how they moved around and where they you know cut ties with this grand lodge and joined this grand lodge and it would just be fascinating just to visually see the migration of all these lodges especially in florida where you're going not just to georgia but to even south carolina in order to be relevant regular and recognized and and to do work and perform as brothers to keep that fraternity alive it meant that so many of those brethren um it's just a fascinating story of the resiliency of of the fraternity back in that day and what they had to go through so thank you very much Juan. Oh, my pleasure and you know one thing i wanted to mention too is like it, it puts in perspective the level of commitment that these brothers had to keep to keep masonry alive and to keep a place where they could go and you know and be among brothers they could have simply just like okay well i'm not gonna fight you well enough masonry like how much how much resistance does it take today for someone to admit or someone to you know you put a different book on the altar and people get their aprons in a bunch and they sign the <laughs> they sign the demit relax like they're there are brothers in our heritage, in our history, that they were prosecuted, prosecuted for, for what they, for what they believed and for what they held to be of value. And by us keeping this alive and keeping our fraternity thriving, we are honoring these these men's real sacrifice. Like it's not just like pen and paper gestures. Like these brothers had to move. Just think of the logistics of ha of moving from Pensacola, Florida, to South Carolina in the 1780s. Do you move your family? What happens with your livelihood? The things you leave behind? Th this is a significant sacrifice. And like, would we be willing to do that to save our lodge? <sighs> no pressure, brother. <laughs> I love the way you described about 
just the what's been interesting so far <clears throat> um, in these episodes is uh, the geography, as John alluded to, and it really made me think about um, an image that you really don't see that often. Um, I pulled it up because I I think it bears sharing. Um, I'm going to screen share here for everybody. Oh, that's and handsome. This. Oh, there you go. This is the the map that shows what lodges came from where, and how you got your charter. Oh snap! Is this off of Bessel? No, this is off of Midnight Freemasons. Thanks to Steve Harrison. <laughs> Good old. That's all. That's um, a- but th- this may originally come from Bessel. I'm not sure where Harrison got it, but um, he initially uh, had posted this, and when he was talking, of course, about. Uh, I think he was talking about Missouri in the actual piece. So I'll have to go back and look. But um, this shows, you know, 1830. It's got July. It says Lodge 1, 2 was way up there, 3, and maybe 1 was toward the northern part of Florida at some point. Um, and how they have their connections to Georgia and Alabama. And, I mean, it's just a spider web. Oh, yeah. And it's insane. Um Look at Illinois, a preview for Illinois' episode. Illinois, you know, we had two Grand Lodges, and I think Missouri was involved in chartering both of them. (laughs) But, uh, yeah, yeah, there it is. I think you just just type in at the top, I think I wrote Steve Harrison, Midnight Freemasons Grand Lodges, and did an image search, and you'll find it. That's really cool. Cool. I sure would love to see one of those maps where you can see it changing color as yeah it's spread. yeah um, you imagine you gotta build that yeah so we should just there's a brother out there listening you're all tech savvy when, when do you guys do this and share it we'll, we'll share the crap out of it <laughs> that's right like who is the brother that's out there listening that can put together some of these visual animations that like the NPR we need, and like we need it. And we no don't pressure, do but you know, if we could get it done by by next week, that'd be great. Listen, we'll Look. shower with you with with uh Praise. with merch and like muchos pesos. Muchos. I don't have I don't have titles to give you, so sorry. But I can say thank eminent visualization editor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, ninety six degree of the super AV <laughs> guy or Something. We could make up some titles. Grand Oculus. <laughs> the Grand Oculus. Visual <laughs> effects. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you wanna if you wanna have the best titles in the world, you gotta look up the Memphis Wright. Man, best titles. Word up. Okay, this has been great. Um, thank you very much, Juan. Let's go around the horn for final thoughts and shameless plugs, starting with Robert. What say you? Ah. Well, of course. You have to give a shout out to Juan for the work as you did. Juan, it's not easy coming up with these uh, with these records. And if you guys watching saw the uh, the graphic I put up, you see how confusing it is. Now, visually, usually people can grasp it pretty fast, but take all that and put it on paper, and you got to pull all that out. And so it's really difficult. So Juan, thank you so much for for putting that together. Now we all know where Florida came from. Um, I, I like this whole series. There were some people in the YouTube chat that said they really like the idea <clears throat> of uh, the histories of the Grand Lodges, and I have to agree. And we we've joked in um, you know private conversations that we need you know the other forty five <laughs> states or whatever to hop on, and, and we should get somebody to do those eventually. Um, it is fantastic to hear the history of these things. Um, I'm going to be. Uh, here's the plugs part. Uh, I'll be at uh, uh, Camp Masonry in Toledo, Ohio, and just a, uh, on the 10th. So I hope anybody out there uh, who's going to go, come say hi. They've got, like, don't come to see me. Come to see everybody else because they've got an incredible lineup of dudes and the events and everything that's going on. I'm really excited because I love camping and I love masonry. And I don't know. It's kind of weird they put them together, but. That's awesome. So super stoked about that. And then later on in August, I'll actually be at Gardner Lodge in Kansas over at uh, my brother Alex Powers from the Historical Light Podcast. I'm going to be down at his lodge doing a thing. 
So check that out. Um, and I think that's it. I am a little bit bummed out. I'm going to announce for the first time right here, right now. Mike Hambrick said he can't come to Camp Masonry with me. Bum, 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 bum. So I'm sad about that. But I'm going to get through it, Mike. I'm going to be thinking about you the whole time. I'm put a picture of you in my wallet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to pull it out and look at it every night before I go to bed. Um, yeah, but just thanks for watching. Guy. I really appreciate it and uh, all the work you guys do. It's it's a it's an incredible honor to to be on the show with you guys and and uh, to chat with everybody who comes on and, and chats in the YouTube chat. It's so awesome. So thanks. Oh, got me right in the feels, Robert. Next up, Mike the intern. Yeah, I, the new job is why I can't be there at Camp Masonry this year. But you know, anyway. Um, Juan, great job. Uh, thank you for doing that. It's, you know, very educational. I, I, I love the, you know, the illustration. I mean, even though it's not physical, but it's the description and illustration of how people moved around the, the, the lodges. Um, even that one that, you know, formed and then everybody went to Havana um, <laughs> to get away from the mosquitoes. Um, but, you know, in any case, it's, you know, it's very interesting to hear because it's like, you know, as you were, as they were saying, the sacrifice that these guys make to, to make masonry continue to work. I mean, you know, we know about it in, in our day, you know, we've sacrificed not going to see, staying home and watching Netflix, but uh, in other countries around the world, there's actually countries where guys are still trying to be masons where if they're found out, they're going to be killed, you know? Um, so, you know, I mean, and even back then, that that's not an unrealistic possibility back in the uh, 1700s when we were trying to do this. You know, that's, you know, uh, but in any case, it's uh, amazing. Thank you, Juan. Very cool. Juan, final thought, shameless plugs. I see you have some new artwork. I do. I have some, I have some to share. Let me see. I don't know. This is not the best medium. Especially if you're listening in the podcast <laughs> to see it. Podcast. Yeah. If you're listening in the podcast and you can't see the image that I'm showing to you, it's pretty. Go to Instagram, follow me. You'll see pictures of this on every angle. If you want your very own copy, go to freemasonryart.com. I'll be happy to ship one your way. This is the original. It's an ink charcoal chalk drawing on a 100 and something year old paper. Uh, it's much older than that, actually. So it has all the damage. I I love working on these. It's this is a book that was just deemed to go into the trash, and I've taken page by page and created different works of art. So I keep that book alive, and I get to really enjoy my craft squared. Feel me? Mm -hmm. My craft squared. Yeah. Uh, so go to freemasonryart.com and sign up. And for the brothers that have signed up for the Masonic Mystery Box, it's on its way. I'm running a little bit behind because I have a full house. Uh, this is the summer, and I am doing 100% of everything. So I'm running a little bit behind on shipping the boxes, but you're going to get it, and you're going to love it. Freemasonryart.com. Thank you, brothers. Thank you, Juan. Uh, you continue to knock it out of the park every time. Thank you. Just awesome, awesome work. You know, the, the last thing I'll say is uh, regarding the Grand Lodge of Florida, it's interesting that the Grand Lodge of Florida was established in 1830 while it was still a territory. It didn't become uh, admitted into the Union until March 3rd, 1845. And so um, you have about a 15-year period where the Grand Lodge is operating as a sovereign jurisdiction before the state is actually a, a sovereign jurisdiction uh, within the the federal uh, union. So that that's that's an interesting concept to think of how Grand Lo a Grand Lodge was existing before there was even a state. So uh, it shows again the um, the sovereignty of Freemasonry and and what these brothers did to um, progress and form and union unionize quote unquote. Uh, the the speculative Freemasonry we operate today. So uh, very fascinating. Thank you, Juan, for your research. And next week, who do we have next week? Do we have Mike or do we have RJ? 
and Mike. Mike Hambrick will give us the, the history of the Grand Lodge of Ohio, so you won't want to miss that. And uh, if you, I hope you guys have been enjoying the series. If you've been enjoying the series, you have two more uh, Grand Lodges to check out. And if you don't like the series, you only have two more <laughs> Grand Lodges that you need to hear about. Uh, but again, it's fascinating how every Grand Lodge, just like every lodge, has its own history. Uh, so we hope you guys have been enjoying this as much as I have. Um, thank you very much for watching. We'll see you next week. And keep searching for more light. Have a good night.